Welcome and good afternoon, everybody, to uh, the last uh, talk of the Digital Food 2021 series before the summer. We will continue uh, in the fall. So uh, just first of all, happy summer, everybody. It's uh, weather's getting nice and uh, traveling is also, I think, resuming around the world, some parts of the world. So uh, um, also, it's really a pleasure and honor for uh, me and the organizer for this series to uh, share a number of topics in the last um, four months since uh, January 21st around the topics of uh, uh, digitization and digitalization of agri-food systems. Uh, to introduce, I'm Tiffany Tsui. I'm the co-organizer and moderator of this uh, Digital Food 2021 series. I'm Chinese, I'm also Dutch. I'm living right now in the Netherlands. I focus on sustainability, technology and transformation and bridging East with West. Together with uh, Dick Fearman, founder of uh, Foodlog, we developed the concept of a digital food uh, series to focus on the theme of connect to connect data, technology, and strategy, and connecting people, ideas, and regions. So in the, of the last 12, today's last 12th talk, from this 12th talk, we are uh, have we gathered around 300 uh, agro-food entrepreneurs from 25 countries uh, to uh, sit together and learn from each other. So this theme of connect, I would say we are really happy that we are actually off to a pretty good start. And now with the coming six months, we're preparing a number of tracks to continue the discussion. So today we will introduce, actually this today's theme is the introduction of a new topic to the digitization, which is a kind of a, like, let's call a big and hairy topic, which is the health topic from soil health to human health. What is the connection? Do we know if there's a connection? How do we establish the connection? And how do we combine that with digitization technologies to help us to um, ascertain this connection and make also value for consumers? So today we have uh, three speakers, uh, Wim, Peter, and Dick. Uh, we'll go into different directions and different perspectives on this uh, health topic. And also for the last time before summer, I would like to thank you for the sponsors who uh, made this series possible. That's KTBA, Info Support, Sinkforce, City of Rotterdam, Profit in South Holland, Greenport, West Holland, Leiden, Delft, Erasmus University, and Wageningen University. So before we start, we would like to actually just start with a, a small poll of what do you think is important topic for you that you would like to see this uh, platform to further develop? Kuhn, can you pull up the poll question? So there are a number of uh, topics that we can continue to develop at as a conceptual level or as actual product uh, or policy. So policy or actual digital solutions such as digital dashboard, which we discuss in one of our series, uh, developing taxonom taxonomies or discussion of topic on the goodness paradox or governance topics. So please uh, make, make your the choices or choice that you think most relevant to you. Um, to start, Dick, I'd like you to ask you to all, uh, introduce this big topic to us today. What is the topic on health? Why is it relevant to digitization? On health and soil. And we have a very different audience today, uh, so welcome. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be able to introduce this topic to you. Uh, usually we have the digital food audience and now we're introducing soil and health to our usual digital food audience. And there is a completely different audience apart from some people. So I don't know if this poll uh, is, will, will be representative for the people who used to attend. I'll introduce the, uh, the topic of soil to stomach. Why are we talking about it? And why do we introduce it in our digital food series? And that is because we're going to need zillions and really literally zillions of data to study this vast topic. Something is 
now in the air, and we call it vitality, um, and it has something to do with bacterial life and um, everything that is going on in soil that is outside of us and that comes through our mouth, through our mouth, inside of us. The gut is our inside. And the new trend is absolutely there. We need something vital to fight the new diseases that are coming up. COVID has brought this even further to our attention. How are we going to study it? That is the question. Why, are, why is it important and how are we going to study it? And this guy, this Anderson, with his book on vitality, is one of the examples. And what does his book say? Actually, we need a new kind of food, a food with a quality uh, of unrefined natural complexity. The text that is there isn't that important. It just states that. That is, short. so the quality of unrefined natural complexity is shorthand of all the words that are there. Now, how are we going to study this? And why are we going to study this? Because we're confronted, and in the Netherlands we know this from the past few weeks, uh, we know that we are wrecking our soils, and in one week they are too dry, and in the other week they are flooded. And that has to do with the way we use our soils in intensive agriculture. We need to do something about this. And the thing we need to do about it has also to do with bringing back the original life in soil and the original quality of the food that comes from that original soil quality. We have to better, under, better understand how agriculture, intensive agriculture with high yields, has changed soil life and the way plants grow, but we know far from enough about the effects. And that is what Wim van der Putte, I'm very happy that we have him, is going to explain to you. And the, the image that you see on the right-hand side says soil. Wim will explain that there is soil life, fungi, bacteria, little animals in the soil, and they do a lot. And if you kill them, you kill a lot of soil resilience and you'll, call, you'll kill the quality of food, perhaps, that comes out of it. But do we understand what is going on? No. So we need to understand far more. Um, then in 2016, and that is when I first got to know him, had a lecture in the Rode Hoot in Amsterdam. And the big question was, what is the link between the human uh, microbiome and the soil's microbiome? They are directly connected via food. We expect there is a complex natural link, but what do we know about it? And when he introduced it with a colleague, um, they said, yes, there is a link. We need to study it, but what do we really know? Nothing much. And yet we have to know much more about it because we can fight diseases like uh, COVID and other infectious diseases uh, killing them, uh, developing vaccines, but probably we need to kill them or, or we need to resist them with life. And that is what this new paradigm is about. How to cope with this in a natural way? And the other question is, of course, can it be done? That is a big question. So how to study this? What is certain is that we'll need a lot of data, lots and lots of data. There are right now only ideas, hypotheses of what could be going on. We need lots of data to find out what is going on and probably multiple approaches. And some of the example of those multiple approaches are there. Uh, the two Aaron's from the Weizmann Institute in Tel Aviv, Aaron Elenaf and Aaron Siegel are using algorithms to find out about the complex relations. So they've given up looking for causal relations. They see algorithms that can predict very well what is going on. And that is one of the approaches. 
Next to them on the right-hand side is Jan Willem Erismann from Leiden University. Um, he says, in a way, nature is a black box, but what you can do is learn from practices and endpoints. So let's study what, uh, the practi what practices produce as endpoints, and let's try to manage soil life from there on. And that is something you could do with food as well. It is where Peter Vosshol comes in, perhaps, and we'll have Peter. I'm very happy to have him. He's trained as a physiologist, and he decided that it is a rather limited study. You need to study reality in reality in its complex context. And is one studies, and lots of N is one studies, and study the stories that come from that. And that has something to do, perhaps, with the same kind of practices and what do these practices produce if you study the stories. In the US, a Dutch guy is working there on uh, the quality of foraging and real, real feed for, for animals. Is it more nutritious? What are the nutrients in that and what do they produce? So we'll need multiple approaches, lots of data, and probably a universal taxonomy that would be something we could wish for so that we can learn from all of these expensive studies and expensive research from all over the world, combining them and trying to find somewhere a threat in this uh, complex matter that is um, soil, the soil microbiome and the human microbiome. How are they linked? What is going on, the two of them? It's a very complex topic. We want to introduce it in this series, Digital Food, because we think it'll digitalize research. So digitalizing research and digital management of businesses will get together somewhere if retailers, for example, and uh, big food processors want to offer us healthy food. And that is what I wanted to say, introducing this topic in this series. Um, at the end, we will tell you how we will continue this in autumn. Tiffany, I give the word and the floor back to you. Yes, thank you, Dick. So, uh, Wim, you are an expert um, and you studied long-term uh, on the topic of uh, soil health, soil biodiversity. You are a head of the Department of uh, Terrestrial Ecology at the Netherlands Institute of Ecology. Um, I don't see you, maybe Queen, you can put feature Wim. <laughs> so Wim, um, over your long years of uh, dedication in researching soil health, what has evolved and how do you see this subject change with maybe perhaps pushed by COVID as people, consumers, the world is now becoming more aware of the importance of soil biodiversity and human health. Um, yeah, um, to link it to COVID is an interesting challenge, um, actually, because one of the, there are many viruses in soil, but luckily they are not coronaviruses that are in soil. And, so in nature, viruses and also pathogens play an important role. And so what I've learned from over the years is that um, it will be a challenge to look at things in their full context and see if we want to, well, to restore sustainability, so to speak. Then we have to go, we have to go back to nature and study what is happening there. Um, so for my, for my introduction, I will just... Um, have a short presentation um, and uh, let's see if I can, I can find it. Um, e. This is always... Uh, Searching. <laughs> you got it? No, I don't have it yet. I'll give you a few, few minutes. One moment. In the meantime, Kun, maybe you can show us already the poll results while well, Wim is working on the presentation. 
Okay. The, um, I think also our uh, questions also maybe a little bit on the abstract level, like uh, global governance. In the end, the topic on data and digitization really comes down to governance, but uh, it's also a one of another big hairy topic. But we see that the, uh, the topic of digital dashboard is indeed uh, very relevant. It's something that uh, can be developed uh, already, for example, starting at the EU level, and then the kind of solutions that can also be uh, used or propagated or developed for around the world. Bas basically, it's um, digital solutions that combining farm management with the uh, data on, for example, biodiversity, pesticide use, uh, also carbon trading. So that's a very uh, important subject. I think uh, in the in our uh, fall sessions, we'll go into deeper. Okay, so Wim is um, okay with the the presentation. So please yeah, tell us what what do we know about the soil, or what actually what we do not know. <laughs> yeah. So can you see my full screen? Tiffany, you can. can. Oh. Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Let's mute it. Can you hear me now? You don't yes, we can. Me? Yeah, yeah, you can. Okay, because I was just looking for. Uh, you can hear me and you see my full screen. Yeah, I loaded up my um, presentation from the stick, but I didn't put it on the desktop. So that was giving the problem, sir. Okay, so this is my perspective on uh, from soil to stomach um, and then uh, um, the role of healthy soils. So actually the way how I consider soil health is that um, soil health is something which is completely connected uh, to uh, plant health, to animal health and human health and ultimately to societal health because many things that we um, eat and drink and we are, are passing through the soil over and over again. And then maybe a bit bizarre thing, but in the end, um, if our life has come to an end, we might un end up in soil or somewhere else, but uh, ultimately we'll, we will be part of the soil system as well. And so sometimes I make the joke that uh, I'm also taking care of good soil health so that I have a good afterlife as well. Um, but until that is the case, uh, let's enjoy the pleasure to speak about healthy soils. So there is a definition of what is a healthy soil. A healthy soil is something which maintains a diverse community of soil organisms that help to control plant disease, insects, and weed pests, and they form beneficial symbiotic relationships with plant roots. Um, and, and also the soil organisms in a healthy soil, they recycle essential plant nutrients and they also improve the soil structure, um, which also has a good um, re repercussion for soil water and nutrient holding capacity. Uh, and, and ultimately they improve crop production. And this is interesting because this definition ends with ultimately improve crop production. And that's exactly where it's going wrong with soil health. Um, so, um, which I will explain in a minute. So, so what are these soil organisms that we are speaking of when we look at this, at the healthy soil? Well, then this is sort of a, 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 a just a, a cartoon of what you could find if you just look into soil. You you will have top left uh, mycorrhizal fungi, other fungi, bacteria. Uh, nematodes, tardigrades, um, springtails, mites, potworms, uh, millipedes, and uh, wood lice, uh, um, uh, centipedes, and um, earthworms, uh, ants, wood lice, uh, flatworms, moles, and this all in many many species you can you can find in soil, and this soil biodiversity actually is the basis of many soil health related functions. And if you want to know how diverse, how, how species rich soil is, so if you take one handful of soil, then you can have about 500 taxa, 5,000 taxa, sorry. Uh, and the taxon is something which is like a species, but the species concept in soil is not always uh, as clear as above ground. So you may find 5,000 species in a handful of soil. 
if you realize that in the Netherlands you have 1400 wild plant species and in total with garden plants and trees and so in the forest planted trees you have about 5000 species of plants so you can have the same amount of species of soil organisms in your hand as we have amount of species of plants uh, in the whole Netherlands and if you look at total numbers it's as many as uh, there are individuals uh, as many individuals as humans uh, on earth so about uh, 7 billion um so soils are really very, very species rich. And all these species take care for many functions, uh, which is already in the definition of soil health. So you can have the breakdown of waste, uh, uh, you have uh, developing of antibiotic resistance or not, you can have soil organisms that are removing pesticides and nutrients, uh, some build soil structure, uh, they can fix nitrogen, sequester carbon, Etc. Etc. So soil biodiversity has many many functions, and if you have a healthy soil, then you have all these functions carried out. Um, the it's even so that uh, that soil uh, organisms that they have an effect on the health of plants, and this works this way that uh, the soil organisms. Uh, uh, that uh, are um, connected to the roots of plants, they sort of induce all kinds of defense um, systems within a plant so that once a root is attacked, for example, by a root feeding nematode uh, or by a pathogenic fungus or eaten by a root herbivore, that the defense signals go up in the plant and they can also affect the above ground plant defense against root herbivores. For example, they can uh, enhance the production of volatiles, which attract natural enemies that can predate on the shoot herbivores. And this is what is called induction signals. So if you have a healthy soil, then through induction of plant defense uh, mechanisms and plant defense metabolites, they can also influence the plant protection against above ground natural enemies. And in my group, we study these uh, phenomena from very, very small scale uh, in the lab to uh, outdoor mesocosms to the field and even worldwide. Um, if we look at the biological invasions, uh, so we then we study what's going on if a plant is completely disconnected from its natural soil biodiversity. So, but the, the main question I want to address, so I, I could have gone into the area of um, micronutrients or other things, uh, but actually I want to make the point here that, um, which, is a, which is a debate currently, um, and we ecologists are often uh, accused of um, saying something stupid or something wrong when we say that things are going wrong with soil. And the issue is that, um, for example, in the Netherlands, where we have highly productive soils, that people say, why are these soils in a bad shape if we get the highest primary production, the highest yields that you can imagine? Well, I will explain what the problem is. So, so this is considered good farmership uh, in the Netherlands. If your rows are um, sharp, if you are just um, suppressing the weeds and the pathogens, if you are just putting good nutrients on the soil and so on and so on. But the question actually is, are these intensively used soils healthy? And this is something that we um, that we um, studied in a, a European project called Soil Service. And then we had uh, field um, studies in Sweden, the UK, the Czech Republic, and in Greece. And we looked at pasture, extensive rotation, and intensive rotation. And so if you then look at what is this land use intensity doing with the soil biodiversity, and now the, the order is exactly in the other direction. So this is, oh no, this is in the same direction, sorry. This is grassland, this is extensive agriculture. This is intensive agriculture in four countries, Sweden, the UK, the Czech Republic, and Greece. These are, these three um, panels are three types of representation of soil biodiversity. You can see that in all the countries, soil biodiversity goes down the more intensively you use the land. So this is exactly what is happening. If we increase land use intensity, we decrease soil biodiversity. And therefore, we also decrease all the functions that the soil biodiversity provides. So pathogen suppression, 
um, carbon st uh, storage, aggregate formation, water holding capacity, and so on and so on. Uh, and the reason why we still have these high productivities in these in these um, uh, biodiversity declined soils is that we just supply the nutrients by the manure. We just kill the pathogens by the herbicides. We till the soil by heavy machinery. And that's why we have such high productivity. So we can have high productivity at the same time as that we have low biodiversity. But if you look at, at the complete soil health, then what we are missing is all the other ecosystem services provided by soils. So the point is that what you see is that what we are doing at this moment, so if this is 1850 and now 2014, we just increase the yield. This is uh, cereals. Um, we increase the yield in enormously. Um, but by doing that, we decrease the overall soil health because we just maximize one aspect, which is yield. And but at the same time, we minimize all the other aspects that are provided by the soil. So, and then if you look at the sustainable development goals, and I put a blue mark in all the goals where soil plays a role. So if you try to um, solve the, the hunger situation in the world by, by maximum yield, by maximizing yield, and at the same time, you are decreasing all the other sustainable development goals where soil plays a role. So. So you 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 you, you 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 try to reach SDG two by maximum yield production, and then you're decreasing three seven three six seven twelve thirteen fourteen and fifteen, and this is basically what's going on. And so if we really want to uh, to have an answer for from soil to stomach, then we also have to do something on on this aspect. That's why I want to uh, to stop. Thanks, Wim. So let's have a poll question to test if uh, our audience remember the sheets from Wim on the um, chemical <laughs> and yield relationship. No, I'm just kidding. So the topic is difficult because um, I actually started my career working for biodiversity conservation NGOs um, for consumer or everyday person, uh, this conservation topic is not necessarily understood by everybody. For example, in the, I think uh, everybody probably do know WWF, the World Wildlife Fund, which uses the panda as their, uh, Chinese panda as their uh, symbol. It is a story when they started in the 70s in a, a big charity uh, event, uh, when they, the organizers show the picture of the cute panda being endangered, that raises a lot of attention. That's got a lot of uh, uh, sponsorships to get a program going. So in a typical, in an already difficult biodiversity topic, people tend to associate with things we recognize, a panda or for seal or whales or for the big mammals, basically. But soil is difficult. We have, uh, you're talking about 5,000 taxa of uh, soil organism, but we don't see them. We don't know what they do, do. We don't have the data. So on the topic soil health, I think a number of topics relating to indeed, how do you quantify the, the benefit, the impacts, and also how do you do the, let's say the storytelling, conveying benefit and to decision makers and to consumers. So which brings me to my second, uh, the third speaker, Wim von der Putte, uh, that he, Wim works on bridging nutrition and soil health. <laughs> you, I think, uh, one uh, uh, big uh, uh, achievement on your uh, um, CV is that you dedic you're dedicated to uh, working on diabetics, uh, reversing diabetics. And my mom suffers from diabetics for years already. So I think there's many, if that can be uh, really through diet, through uh, alternative means to reverse such chronic disease, that will be really blessing for humankind. That will certainly be a very concrete benefit when you can link the bigger planet health with human health. So Peter, please, uh, maybe I didn't assume, yeah. <laughs> please uh, tell us a little more about what you do and uh, what is the relationship between nutrition and um, soil? All right, thank you very much for this uh, introduction. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen. So hopefully everybody sees this. Uh, let me start. Yes, everybody sees this. 
Yes. First slide. So I'm Peter Vossel. I'm, um, as I said, a physiologist, medical physiologist. I worked 20 years in academic uh, field of uh, clinical and preclinical uh, studies towards the, um, let's say, the pathophysiology of uh, type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, and obesity. Um, and uh, looking down, um, uh, let's say, a cell and uh, at specific mechanisms and um, realizing uh, following my career that at some point we need to just broaden our vision um, because physiology you can't focus on one cell or one organelle or one even uh, organ in, the, in the, our bodies um, they're all interconnected they all communicate with each other uh, and certainly of course uh, since the let's say early 2000s when the first studies on um, gut bacteria and, and causing insulin resistance uh, Good friend of mine I started that in in, uh, in uh, Denmark, Sweden, and uh, but also in Belgium and France. Um, of course, the question is what 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 is the relation? <clears throat> and since six years, I work for the Louis Wilk Institute, and I'm trying to uh, step away basically from the cell per se and mechanisms per se, and go to what what what's happening in the bigger picture. So if you talk to soil to stomach, or as we try to say uh, um, uh, at the stomach, but also what comes out of the stomach, what comes out of our bodies uh, is feces. Um, and let's go beyond because we, are, we try to link it to health. Um, and a picture like this is uh, the, the carrots with all the uh, soil attached to it or remains of the soil attached to it. But of course, this is never how we eat it. Um, and that's where... I like to uh, to add a little level of, uh, let's say, a simple relationship between soil and health. Um, I think it, it will never be the case and we'll never find it because there are so many things in between what soil produces and what we take as nutrition. So food is something different than nutrition, in a sense. And I will try, that, try to explain that uh, with some... Uh, say observations and some uh, uh, experience. Um, from Lou Gogos, this is basically if you, if you talk to the cycle of life, then is this this is the things we're talking about. Have you know soil? Uh, soil important for grass, uh, grass and herbs and stuff. Uh, the cow eats the cow produces milk, and that's what we drink. Oh, we also eat meat and we eat things that grow on it. So it's clear that there's an interrelationship. Uh, enjoying nature, enjoying the cow, just see it walk through the, the paddocks is, is also a um, addition to health. So it's much more than pure the food or nutrition we eat. It's also about uh, experience uh, of nature, being in nature, listening to the birds or seeing animals or observing trees or uh, uh, plants and that sort of stuff. So it's much more complex than just the food delivers health. Um, so I'm not a big fan of the uh, the pill theory where you say every you can, you can distill everything to one pill and it will make you he healthy. Um, uh, and real food needs to be real food. You need to eat real food. So also the complexity is as as uh, regenerative agriculture or circular uh, agriculture. That's the right picture where you see everything is interconnected. So the soil you have. What kind of soil do you have here? Um, so I live in uh, Kulenborg, which is close to the lake, this river. Um, but if you go up north, there's more clay. If you go down south, there's more sand. All that thing change, but it also changes the animals that live on there, which you can enjoy. You can see prey animals, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a big uh, relationship. But the main thing, of course, is what is our consumption? What do we consume? And these are uh, data from the recent uh, Dutch uh, um, inventory on what we eat. Uh, they each uh, twice, twice or every two, second year, third year, they ask uh, approximately 5,000 uh, Dutch people uh, what they eat. And this is the percentage uh, in purple, uh, uh, sort of uh, gaining the minimum of 200 grams of veggies a day. As you can see, that's a very, very bad number. So less than 4% of our, uh, let's say, the younger generation eats more 200 or more grams of veggies a day. And even if the, in the uh, old age people were 70 and above, 
it's only 25% of the people eat 200 grams or more. Uh, fruit is, is as bad. Um, and with fish, you can say, well, almost 50% of the people at least eat once a week fish. And this is the problem. This is the main problem. Uh, that we, of course, you have soil and we have an overproduction of uh, certain uh, monoculture, stuff like that. But if we don't consume what we need to consume, and as you can see, it's we're far off. The average in Holland is 137 grams of vegetables a day. Um, and that's a big difference. And what happens if we only change the amount we eat, literally independent of where it comes from, of how it's, how it's produced? Uh, and this is our reality as well. Uh, let's say uh, people of my age, uh, a little bit younger, but uh, um, uh, Jan here is, uh, is 55 years. He's diagnosed with diabetes type 2 in 1992, um, which is quite early on if you uh, count backwards. Very young. Normally in 1980, it was uh, 65 years of age. And currently the diagnosis age of uh, type 2 diabetes is around 50. So that's a big problem. Uh, but 55 years, the 17 different kinds of medications for diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, gout, and probably a few other things. He, he injects 70, uh, 64 units of insulin per day. And he's obese. He weighs 130 kilograms. His average veggie intake was 120 grams a day. And this is basically the standard American diet. You can also build it the standard uh, Western diet, it's uh, white, it's beige, it's, it's uh, uh, of course, packed with nutrition, um, but it's all fast. Fast food, simple, uh, a lot of carbohydrates, too much carbohydrates, too much uh, uh, isolated or processed uh, fats, etc., etc. And if you then take a program like reverse diabetes now, which not only includes the nutrition, but also the self-management. So what, what am I, what am I doing? How can I change my reaction to food? How can I change what I eat? And of course, you have to take into account sleep and exercise and stress management, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you see a change to this, a much more healthy whole food uh, dietary uh, process. Uh, so whole foods, fresh, unprocessed. Uh, unprocessed is the big thing, yeah? the Nova uh, um, scale is, is coming up more and more. Uh, so we want to stay to one, perhaps two, where you don't go to three or four, uh, because that's, um, I, I, in my opinion, uh, always unhealthy. So we can't produce healthy food in a, fa in a fabric. Uh, we have to produce healthy food on the soil we have. And that can be added uh, protein uh, coming from uh, either animal or plants. Both are, of course, essential. Uh, we can't do um, uh, with uh, we can't live on basically one or at least that is very hard to do and on the other one only the other one is also a very challenge, big challenge and if you follow this idea of uh, whole foods and you think about yourself self-care uh, you see a lot of the uh, things uh, improving i will spare you details but uh, the, the details is basically um in the picture. So Jan is uh, a year later, did a program, six months, he weighs 92 kilos. If you remember, 130 kilos when he started, no pills, no insulin, normal book regulation, no more diabetes. And his average vegetable intake increased to almost 350 grams a day. It's possible. It's not that hard. But people need a guidance. People need guidance to take in what it is. So independent of where it came from, because there's no focus on uh, uh, organic or uh, biodynamic or whatever, it's just more vegetables, more vegetables, more vegetables, including pulses and uh, et cetera. Um, and you see it's possible, and you see a huge change, losing weight and improving your diabetes. It's not that hard, but you have to have the, the guidelines. And why do I think it's important to look at the reality of life, so real life robustness, as we like to call it. I mean, of course, you have questions. Everybody has questions. And if you go do some self research, uh, you change something, you take a diet, you read a book, uh, you apply a change in uh, where you buy your food or how you buy your food, etc., you will solve some of those questions. 
but you also remain with a lot of other questions. Um, so you take your own puzzle and you take your own pieces. Um, and of course, self-care helps and uh, attending to sleep and stress reduction, of course, everything helps at some point. But together is much stronger because we, in, as a group, we have much more data, individual data, and as one as uh, did uh, introduced. And if we combine that and you do a lot of uh, data mining, data sharing, for instance, it's not only about mining, but it's also sharing of data. It's uh, machine learning, it's the guts, it's the microbiome, it's things you can uh, uh, analyze from your experience, but then within the group, you add the medical profession because usually they are, let's say, on the outside of the interaction about food because they only are interested basically medically as you as a physiologist. I know that it's only the internal based part and what you eat is not as interesting. It's better to talk to veterans in a sense if you are, sorry, uh, veterinarians, uh, because the first thing a veterinarian will ask you, so what does your animal eat and how does it poo? Uh, and, and I have never heard any GP ask me, well, well I don't come that often to a GP, but what I what I ate and, and uh, how my uh, poo was. So uh, you have to add the whole picture and you might come up with a solution. Um, so that's why the digital food but the digital data of what you are doing, how you did things, because it's not going to be um, uh, one one solution for everybody. Right? Up to 80% perhaps potentially uh, it's the same, but there is also a uh, sort of space for, um, yeah, taking a little bit of uh, changes uh, which are specific for you. Um, and that's important. So you realize there's a, if you take your food, which is, uh, let's say, whole foods, unprocessed and fresh, um, that's a big step for everybody. And then, of course, do you like tomatoes or do you like uh, avocados or uh, that sort of stuff? And that, that's that's the sort of nitty gritty and the fine tuning you can achieve. But we need to know from each other what's happening. So that's why collecting all those NS1s or all those group data or uh, interventions where your your personal experience. Um, and that's basically what I wanted to share with you. Thank you, Peter. I think uh, from the, you just introduced a very important, uh, uh, the last sheet on digital health. Of course, in the medical world, uh, the topic of uh, digi digital health, uh, medic medical monitoring is not uh, that new. A lot of uh, big uh, uh, organizations, uh, hospitals are working on to monitor uh, our, for example, uh, nanobots, robots that were cruising our blood in the future to tell everything about our health. So mm -hmm. combining, if you then take really to the source of, you say, what we are, what we eat, to really establish this data link between the agro food chain, the sources where things are produced, how is the health at the, um, the farm level towards you know, how that impacts our health. Of course, it's a long-term project, but certainly that opens up a complete, uh, uh, let's say new field where this mm -hmm. digitization uh, can go really from farm to stomach. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think one thing is we are what we eat, we are what our food eats. That, I think that's much more uh, uh, accurate in a sense. Um, but it's, uh, no, I agree, yeah. So we'd like to actually open up with uh, some questions. We have uh, uh, today's, this is a new topic, uh, but it's also kind of uh, it's a summary conclusion from our last 12 talks. So I actually like to just invite everybody to share what you learned from today or from past talks you joined or questions would you like to see in the uh, future topics. Uh, I see also we have a new uh, participant, but also our, our uh, speakers from past, like uh, Anka Hemminger from Cargill, uh, who works on digitizing um, uh, feed data. Uh, that's already a lot of experience in developing databases and working with industry players to develop, let's say, common taxonomy and data standards. And we have also Wilbert, who's uh, developing data-driven um, storytelling, basically to tell the story, what's happening with the chain to consumers. Uh, I would like to hear from you also, what do you think when we now expand the topic, actually, actually broadening the scope, 
because of the uh, possibilities of digital technologies that to bring this topic of food production with health and medical. So um, there are a number of questions. Uh, I think uh, I would see, uh, uh, I would ask uh, the, our audience who gave questions before and also like to ask everybody to give comments. Uh, maybe ask uh, B.S. Flores, would you like to explain your question that you put in a comment? You can turn on your camera and your microphone, please. Actually, actually invite everybody to do that so we can see you all and then wave to each other. P.S., you're still there? Yes, unmuted. Yes, please. Hi to all. And maybe introduce a word about yourself. Um, my name is P.S. Flores. I'm involved in modern agriculture, meaning um, creating healthy soils for healthy food production in a, number of, in a number of countries. Okay, great. Uh, you have a for, question, for, yeah. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Bim and Peter, for your very nice contributions to this meeting. And Peter, thank you for just handing me over a beautiful phrase. We are what our food eats. That's brilliant. Thank you. I'll use it <coughs> with your permission. Um, yeah, my question is sure. on uh, on the, the number of elements in our plants. We all live and work with a 160-year-old principle of uh, mineral nutrition for plants. And we know which minerals are essential for growth. But like, like plants and like human beings, we couldn't possibly stay healthy with 17 elements. That's physically impossible. So many of the trace elements that are never analyzed, that are present in the soil, that are absorbed by plants, but never replenished in the soil, many of these uh, elements are subject to be lost somewhere. Uh, because we don't uh, uh, we don't bring back to the soil what we take, and we also know that many of the smallest metabolites like lanthanum and cerium are essential in producing metabolites in plants that keep and in this way they keep us healthy. So I always have this this feeling that even 200 grams of vegetables or 400 grams of vegetables is not even enough to bring us what we really need. And I would like Peter and, and, and other um, people to, uh, to reply on that, to answer that. Well, I, I, I love it. It's one thing that I have to leave soon because I have to collect my kids from school, but it's, it's unfortunate of this planning. But um, no, I fully agree. I mean, if we focus on 16 elements, 17 elements, if we focus on 30 elements, if we focus on 100 elements, we'll never have enough. Um, in my simple opinion, of course, if we need the diversity of fruit to um, eat all the, all the uh, let's say, macro and micro nutrients we need. And they come from different sources. So they just, they come cannot only come from plants and they cannot only come from meat or animals. So you need the diversity of uh, plant protein and animal protein. Um, if you look at the, the, let's say the ranking of uh, the most nutritious foods, um, then uh, you end up with uh, animal protein. Um, they have most of, let's say, the essential amino acids. They have um, uh, all of the elements, uh, 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 minerals and stuff we need, um, uh, uh, vitamins, uh, also fat-soluble high vitamins, etc. Uh, B12, we being one of the words which plants don't have and will never make. Um, so I agree that we'll, we'll, we'll never find out which elements are the most, which are the, the, the minimum sets we need to live on. Um, of course, we adapt. Our system is, is, has learned to adapt 
in a big way to, uh, let's say, um, scarcity of foods and, and uh, specific minerals and, and uh, vitamins some way. But at some point you reach a disease. Um, and um, yeah, the simple solution is probably um, uh, we'll never find out 100% what we need to eat, which is healthy, but uh, diverse, fresh and unprocessed is probably the way forward. Um, um, and even also in plants, eh, if you just look at the, uh, the phytonutrients that are in plants, uh, I always use the example of uh, just ginger being very healthy in, uh, also in Chinese medicine, etc. Uh, probably we know 25 elements there. Uh, if we do a uh, extensive gas chromometer or something, we come up to almost 250 or 300 different elements, uh, of which 170 to 200, we don't even know what they are. We don't know the structure. We, we only see a peak somewhere on a, a technical machine, but we don't know how they look like. And we certainly don't know what they do. So we can't synthesize food for our health. That's my opinion. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, uh, Peter. So there's another question from Marco. Marco, would you, Marco von Ness, would you like to introduce yourself and also ask the question? I think I would like to invite other people just in our today's, just jump in and comment, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Marco van Ness. I'm the first time here, so quite a, a, a new. Um, my background is uh, 20 years working in the probiotic development. Um, probiotic for me more medical use at a company called Wingloaf in Amsterdam. Uh, since a year, I'm on my own right now. I started a, an initiative called Back to Nature, and Back to Nature is a foundation that looks for um, insights in um, human health on um, bacterial biodiversity exposure. So how are we connected with nature? in what we eat and what we breathe around us in, in our cities, in our homes, um, um, and, and uh, from the perspective of diverse microbial exposure and more specific, the lack of it and how do we can get that back. And in that sense, uh, soil is of course also an interesting part uh, or well, maybe the, the foundation even. So that's why I was happy with this uh, um, online event. Um, but my question uh, uh, is basically, uh, uh, we, we now had already a presentation on, on, on diversity, uh, um, more focused on microbial diversity is my interest. Is there already a, a scale uh, to, to indicate uh, diversity in, in, in soil and more specific on microbial diversity? Uh, is there, is there, because I, I think the field can be uh, helped if, if it's moving towards some sort of standardization in this area. So I was curious if somebody knew already something about that. Wim, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, there are many, um, uh, actually, since the 1990s, there was already uh, uh, all kinds of work done on uh, do we have indicators of soil life, soil biodiversity, um, and uh, and actually the, the answer there is no. And, and, and your question is, do we have a scale of what diversity that we need in soil, like what you can also have for isolation of your house or if you buy a new washing machine or so? The answer is not yet. Um, but we are so now we have to make we have made the next step in doing so. So we have a project funded by the National Post, Postal Code Lottery, and um, we have we are setting up a calibration center here in, in Wageningen. And this center, well, basically just consider it like a you have a, a scale from the most um, let's say stressed soil to the most natural soil and then uh, farmers who want to to develop more sort of a nature friendly type of uh, management uh, so we, we can help them trying to find out where on the scale are they and uh, you have to realize that if you're this is what you can see at this moment in the success of farmers if they are close to the scale of lower diversity they go to a higher yield so if you if you if you go up the scale in terms of soil biodiversity then you may go down the scale of yield. So you might produce other things like other ecosystem services or maybe more healthy food. 
but so 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 that's why this scale alone is not enough so we also need some optimization mechanism where we can just see how you can go for optimal food production instead of maximal food production that but this is all in under development at this moment and did you have any sort of idea when it comes to time scale when you would expect this to be more sort of accepted this 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 scale oh that's the last part of the sentence makes it more complex so the time scale of 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 having the first results is so we are sampling now in the field so over winter we get a bit more results but then to have it accepted that's something else because sometimes that takes a generation uh, before it's accepted, um, uh, um, yeah, and and but uh, but at least this is something we are working on. So in the past, soil quality was only based on soil chemistry and soil physics. Now we know that we also have, and and soil biology was mostly focused on um, uh, soil-borne pathogens and nematodes and, and 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 so so the nasty organisms in the soil. So now we are sort of bringing soil biodiversity in, and then we, we want to, to develop the triangle of soil, which is physics, chemistry, and, and ecology of biodiversity. And then we have to make a step towards food quality and, and health. So this is sort of where the whole process is. Thanks, uh, Wimba Marco. And it's a, a discussion also I'd like to bring to Wilbert. Uh, who asked a question is, uh, why are we not eating what's healthy? Because um, the, 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 the we need to eat, uh, well, in Peter's story, we need to eat 200 to 400 grams of uh, greens. That's actually kind of a universal fact or known for a long time. For, for as me as Chinese, so we're used to eating, you know, vegetable being a big part of our diet. But then for other countries like uh, Latin America and Brazil or, you know, eating vegetable for a whole meal probably is quite unthinkable, but you know, so the net is also pretty low. So Will, Wilbur, would you like to elaborate on your question is, can we actually change your society by what is needed? It's just by telling what's good, seemingly it's not enough. So how do you sway people to make better choices? Yeah, that's, that's I think the, the $1 million question. <laughs> uh, no, I'm thinking about this every day. <laughs> Uh, so, which uh, which story do the people do people need uh, to uh, change their um, uh, their their food searching attitudes and behavior and bridge the uh, behavior uh, attitudes uh, gap? Um, again, uh, that was the uh, one of the slides uh, uh, that showed okay how much. Uh, uh, veggies we're eating actually or how much fruit we're eating uh, and what is what is necessary what is what would be healthy and i think uh, almost everybody uh, knows this as in uh, grammar school uh, it's part of the classes but somehow uh, people are reluctant to buy the the diets that are good the, the meals that are good for them uh, and uh, I'm wondering every day, really, uh, how you can, how can you influence it? Uh, we're trying to uh, tell automated stories uh, about it, but it's it's still hard. Um, so uh, yeah, maybe uh, with a couple of uh, very experienced people uh, in the um, in the group. Um, yeah, if if if, if one. Uh, is uh, able to tell something about it. I'm just more than curious. Yes, that's uh, indeed a challenge of uh, human sometimes make opposite uh, decision of exactly what is not good for them. So that's also human behavior that makes us human. Um, yeah, like that, is not, not, that is not uh, one day. Yeah? You can make no. one day a mistake or uh, you can be extra, uh, distracted for, for a day. But this is happening 365 days a year. Yes. So it's not it's not an it's not an, an incident. It's this is this is the way we live. Uh, someone else like to in our group to comment on this discussion? I see Yannicka had a question up to uh, Dick. 
Um, I think you are involved in the soil to health research subjects. Would you like to uh, say a few words about yourself and also the, the project you're working on? Yeah, I work at the Ministry of uh, Agriculture and um, I try to, to um, create more funds for research on the, uh, the relation between soil and soil health and the health of uh, crops and uh, human uh, consumption. Uh, that's quite difficult because there is a, a certain uh, a way of uh, reasoning that makes uh, that man uh, um, there is a little bit uh, not not much belief in uh, that it will bring us a society something very very strange, but um, th there is an, a circle way of reasoning. If we haven't proven it, it doesn't exist. Um, that's and that's very strong. And of course, there are a lot of uh, powers that that keep up this um, this way of reasoning. So my question was, what what is a what is a good route, a place, um, a people that we have to involve to address the question of optimization? Thanks, uh, Janneke. And actually, I think uh, we I would like to also uh, add the Anka in the discussion. Anka Hemminga, if you are still there, because in yes. our previous session we talked about the GFLA, which is a, a feed life cycle costing project uh, that was developed over a long period of time, almost ten years, uh, which is addressing kind of multi criteria, uh, more holistic life cycle way of looking at uh, feed. Uh, Anka, would you like to? Uh, comment on our discussion on this topic of optimization, uh, multi-criteria of how these databases can maybe perhaps connect it into soil issue. <laughs> yes. uh, we see you for a minute and you disappeared. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know what's happening with my uh, with my video, but I, at least I will... Yes, we can hear you well, please. Try to do the fight the mic. Um, the the the, the GFLI that you were referring to, Tiffany, is actually um, a database that gives the environmental impact for several raw materials that are being used in feed. Uh, could also be used in food, but mainly feed focused. Um, and I think that the very interesting discussion and debate that um, we got some background on is that we somewhere deep down even though we are not all researchers at the Louis Bock Institute, somewhere deep down we do know what is healthy for us, but it seems that we make a different choice. And we make a choice due to, and there will be a number of factors. Um, and, and that is uh, on what's available, convenient, what we like taste-wise, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you get the environmental impact part. That, that is just another dimension. Um, to that, so could it help? Yes, I think it could. It could help to know and to to um, be a bit more aware about the choices that you make. What kind of impact they will have? Like the avocados have been in the news for being very water, uh, very high in water consumption and irrigation, for example. Um, on the other hand, if if we have a lot of information already today, and I think that's also where the, the question from Billwood is coming from. How do we then help uh, people to make the right choice? Isn't there an overload of information uh, already? And not to make it more complicated than it is, but I heard this morning on the news that they will launch a new kind of campaign for pregnant ladies, again, about prescription, what, it, what is wise to eat. And, and it's not that the information is not available, but, but then what? So why would you not live up to the the prescriptions food-wise when you were pregnant. I find it hard to understand myself because I did, but apparently there are a lot of people who don't. So maybe we need some uh, psychologists. Thanks, thanks, Anka. I think that uh, the, also the, actually the, the, the field goes from a database to scientific research and then actually down to human behavior. So what kind of economics and tools and you can sway human behavior, which actually the topic we can address in our future series is actually in the end, we want to use proper data evidence to help people making 
evidence-based decision making, but same time is actually telling the in some ways the stories people need to hear to perhaps make the right choices, the better choices. Um, we also have a, a number of people I'd like to actually hear from you still here. Um, Michael, Michael Dawkins. Or I see Jose also, I'd like to ask you as well to give some, you, you ask a question before Michael, if, if you're still there. Oh, then I ask, go to Jose because I see your face. <laughs> Can you, uh, uh, Jose, you say, yeah? Would yes, you like to? Jose, yeah. Yes, please maybe give a few words about yourself and then why you're here and what yeah. would you like to add? So um, I work for a company of crop uh, inputs in the biological area. So we work with microorganisms, um, typically isolate from soil and bring it back to soil. Um, so I'm, I'm just interested in the whole food chain. And um, one of the points we have been seeing in the reg regenerate ag agriculture, it's really on the question of pricing at the very end of the food. Um, and the fact that we don't have incentives in agriculture, at least in Europe, um, to produce food in the, um, you know, in the resilient way and to protect the, um, the soil health. Uh, and the mechanisms are simply not there. And what we see as well, bringing microbials back to the soil, it's on the question of getting through all regulatory barriers um, and all the kind of questions because people fear microbials in general. And I think that's a discussion on healthy soils. And, um, you know, if you have an healthy soil, you have lots of microorganisms, but not necessarily they are pathogenic for humans. And I think there's a fear in society because we learn it in school that all this microbiome or all microorganisms are very dangerous for us. And um, we are having several discussions with policymakers at the moment and how this we could change the system and giving value back to the people who are actually protecting soil health, um, which is not there because the drive is on hill at the moment. It's still on hill. Um, and there's no mechanism today or incentives to make growers do the, um, you know, the twist and to preserve the, um, yeah, the soil. And uh, just back to your question, I think it's really um, not really on evidence that people take decisions. It's on the, you know, on the human emotions. And that's, I think I'm a scientist, so I have learned the high way in the last 20 years. <laughs> where you can produce lots of evidence, but still people decide, you know, otherwise. So we need just to connect on the, um, what makes people take in certain decisions. I think that's a good discussion indeed with Wilbert as well, to continue mm. searching of what is the best uh, data support of storytelling, right? Yeah, and, and I think there's a mismatch between what society wants and what we have in terms of, uh, you know, a framework in the policy. And that's uh, when we hear all this Green Deal and the farm to fork strategy, all these nice papers with impossible targets, uh, I would say. Uh, the targets are really impossible with the current situation we have in Europe. But the fact is we don't have the time to operate this transition. Uh, today in Europe and we need big changes because the consumer wants, the farmer wants, um, but we will need some time to operate the transition and I think we need to have a discussion about the price of food, which at the end I think it comes to that, is to say, look over the years, the pricing of the food has been, you know, going down or keeping steady and that's a discussion I think we need to have in the food chain is how much we spend uh, in food and if it's possible to keep going this way without destroying the environment and the ecosystems. That's a great addition. Actually, in our earlier first poll, we asked what are the topics. I think indeed that the relying on voluntary certifications or behavior changes probably is one way, but it's not enough. So normally as economists, you look at the pricing signals. So if, if government indeed start to make uh, junk food, if Nestle already admitted they have 50% unhealthy food, so make unhealthy food more uh, expensive, basically taxing, that will probably will give uh, the right uh, signal changes to consumer, right? That could be one a very interesting discussion from a policy tool point of view. Um, I also see uh, uh, Mr. Vorkom, I don't know your first name, Mnir Vorkom, <laughs> I see all the time. Would you like to uh, give some comments and also about your background? You have to unmute yourself, if you can, to push the unmute button. 
Uh, you have to push the unmute button on your screen. You see the, the, the microphone, you have to click on it. Oh, <laughs> then maybe if you see if you can work on, if you can find it, I would like to ask another uh, person on our panel, uh, Ola Yumuka. I think you're fr from one of our uh, uh, Digital Africa participant from earlier. Would you like to give some comment? I saw you earlier, but uh, you uh, if, you're still, if you're still there. Oh, I don't see them. Now, now call uh, Case or Ivona. Would you like to uh, switch on your camera and then give some comments? <laughs> it's nice when the camera's on. Okay, okay. Oh, uh, when you work on my seat, I think you can talk now. You are you are unmuted now. Okay. Yeah, good. Please. I don't uh, not uh, good uh, English. My, Where are you from? Uh, I'm a far farmer at Flevoland. Okay, nice. And uh, I yeah. can translate if needed. Uh, <laughs> but that is okay. The focus up healthy. Yeah. So you agree with the topic on as a farmer? Yes, I'm a farmer. What do you farm? Uh, potatoes. Ah, of course, from the land of potatoes. Yes, yes. But do you, as because in uh, Dutch uh, soil uh, agriculture, it's quite intensive, as Wim already uh, suggested, and the productivity application of uh, uh, mechanization to increase yield is what the Dutch farmers do very well. Do you see the... Um, relation of the, the, the transition towards more focus on soil biodiversity in uh, your daily work? Yes, yes. D yeah, diversity uh, works, yes. Uh, up and under the ground. Okay. It, it, it's great, but I think it's really nice to have our a real field practitioner to join us on this uh, scientific discussion. So you'll see that there's a lot of in still interest from farmer to understand and to really appreciate the importance of uh, health all the way from farm to stomach, right? Uh, Yannicka, would you, you have another question? Uh, yeah. Um, in my trying to get us more on the research agenda, this, this topic, um, I was told by my uh, manager um, that the EFSA is, does not recognize health claims of specific, specific growing systems, like, for instance, what we call regenerative agriculture. Um, is that an... an, 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 an um, it, it's not a valid reason, I think, because um, um, the, the, the fact that an EFSA doesn't recognize certain uh, systems now doesn't mean that also in the future that will be the case. But I, I, I ask the question, is it true that the EFSA um, does not recognize health claims on specific growing systems? Does anybody know that? Is anybody uh, acquaintance with EFSA and how EFSA, uh, which role EFSA plays in, uh, um, yeah, uh, yes, no. get, uh, yeah, that recognize certain values uh, to certain uh, growing systems according to the way they deal with the soil? Yes. Does does everybody know that? Does anybody know whether that's true? But May I react to that directly, Tiffany, please? Yes, please. Um, it is true that the EFSA will not recognize health claims. Um, not in the last place to avoid responsibility, but in, in my experience, because uh, everybody in regenerative agriculture is, has been fighting with EFSA for already a decade or so, um, without saying it loudly, um, there are specific groups that do tend to have quite an influence on what the EFSA says. And the regenerative lobbyists don't have the amount of money that 
the pharmaceutical companies do have. So uh, there is a role for regenerative farmers to to get their voices and to speak out more loudly. Um, it is not too difficult to make a health claim on food. Why would you? Why would you on earth um, deny that? the amount of pesticides and the interaction of these pesticides uh, do the contrary. They don't add to health. We cannot prove that they are bad for health, but I think that's common knowledge. That would be my comment on this. Uh, EFSA is, is not a friend of um, organic or semi-organic organic farming. I, if I may do a comment just to second on, on, on Prios, I think one of the problems is the mandate of EFSA because the mandate is just on really food safety and not security. So there's, um, so EFSA is not interested in agriculture or how the food is produ produced. And I think that's a problem we have in Europe, the fact that we don't have an agency in terms of agriculture, but we do have one on the safety and just looking at things separately. So we will have separate assessments per individual products, but nobody's really looking at the whole picture. And it's just at member state level in the ministries of agriculture, uh, where we have this view of the 27 um, member states, but we don't have an umbrella at the European level. And we do have an EFSA, as Prio was saying, not really interested in how food is produced um, is just looking for contaminants in foods and um, and that's about it. Now, not looking how food is produced and what is the impact in the ecosystems on the way we produce food. Great. Thanks for your comments, uh, Jose and uh, Piers. I think because we are introducing the new topic of uh, soil health to stomach health or human health, it is a difficult and complex topic. So with this discussion, we're, trying, we're starting understanding basically the linkage between these regulatory bodies, uh, consumers, data and research. So that would also help us to define in our future talks who are the uh, speakers from different perspectives that can help us develop these links. Uh, with this, I'd like to ask Dick, please uh, maybe show us and tell us what we plan to do, what's baking in the digital food oven. I will, Tiffany, and I'll try to share my screen and find back where the presentation is. Where is it? Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear, I can't. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. So that is where, I, where I'd, I'd like to continue with what we've just said. So what we just did is introduce the field. And I'd like to thank Peter and Vim for their introductions. I think they were great and they show it's a very vast topic. And to comment on the last question by Yamaka um, and to link again with Vim's remark on optimal food, there is no agency on optimal food. We need to think about what that is and develop the concept and make it politically relevant, as we said in the chat, because it all depends on what you define. And um, if we want an agency to guard uh, optimal food, we'll need to create it. That is obviously a political discussion, Janneke. So digital food. Um, we will be back with digital food on Tuesday, September 28th, on a community conference. What did we learn and what are the needs and what needs to be developed given the market dynamics and changing government policies? Um, it's a very broad topic. Uh, what we saw already in the poll, this is what came out of it. In our opinion, it's about fair data policies, the digital dashboard introduced by Klein Popper, uh, global normalization and universal taxonomies, the goodness paradox, what is optimal, 
you need to find something that is the optimum. It's a, it's a political discussion. We need to have it. Global governance by nobody in a geopolitically divided world. Perhaps we're the world community here. Uh, thanks to Tiffany, we're in this community now with over 25 community, uh, uh, countries and a community of 300 people. That's interesting. It's a global, the new global community we're trying to create here. So that is what we'll discuss um, on the 28th of September in Digital Food. Um, the next Digital Food series open will be business solutions by providers. So really, what can you do to do your logistics, for example, very boring and very important topics because they all touch on these real uh, hot topics because they, they, they come in as well. And then we've just introduced this new topic and we can, we, we've got a smack what it is about. So we'll do, um, two, so we'll alternate in a month. There will be the original digital food series, the business thing, the governance thing, et cetera, et cetera. And there will be on October 12, November 9, December 7, January 11, and then in February, this new series. We've just got a smack of it, but what is, what does it mean? Optimal food, optimal soils, optimal health. Perhaps that is the way to put it and to put it from a world community on the political agenda of our national communities and the European community. So that is what you can expect from us. We'll mail you about it, but this is the agenda to be. Thank you. Back to you, Tiffany. And I'll stop sharing. Yes, we're back. Back to you, Tiffany. Yeah, thank you, Dick. So uh, I would just like to thank you, everybody who uh, are joining today or followed our previous talks. Uh, if you would like to uh, give comments or question about our future program, please do so. Or ideas. For example, I would like to also email us if you think of it, what might be the topics or speakers, uh, themes that can be addressed especially uh, focusing on developing actual solutions because we would like to build our community based on a good conceptual understanding of key topics, to identify what's driving the, the future, but same time really focusing on bringing um, business solutions to, um, yeah, I see Anka has a uh, comment. Uh, to say, well, yeah, we would like to indeed focusing on what are the actual solutions that can be really solving tomorrow's problem, not future, but really the issue we face today. So in that, we're also uh, be working with uh, uh, companies in IT, uh, in um, large companies to really look at actual solutions together. So there will be a number of the workshops and mass classes. Uh, we'll be really looking forward to your comments and participation. So if I have no more questions, I would just like to say thank you very much. And then also I hope you all had the uh, half already great summer plans to uh, in this summer 2021. And I'll see you back in the fall.